Thank you, Representative Frank. And uh, I told you we were going to ask a few more questions today. Um, this is obviously, we had a, a very uh, intense discussion last night. And I know this is, a very, <laughs> this is very important to all of us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I do know this is an emergency item for the governor. And we are looking at it that way as well. Is that not correct? This is very critical yeah, absolutely. for us. Absolutely. I think it's, uh, I think it's important to 150 members here. And, and you have said, have you not, that uh, it's very important at every step of the process that we're placing the best interests of the child in our care, first and foremost. Absolutely. So the concerns that I expressed last night that I want to go over a little bit more again today uh, have to do with the fact that it doesn't appear anyway to, to me and to some others that we're ensuring that all of the child welfare providers must place the best interest of the child ahead of all considerations, including religious preferences of the provider. So I want to ask again, there's only two references in your bill that have to do with the, the best interest of the child placing limits on the child welfare providers. One of them is it not correct, is legis the legislative intent section. That that's correct. That's, that's correct. correct. Right. And, but the bill allows for providers to exercise their religious refusal in more areas than simply placement decisions, which I think was a lot of what we talked about last night. Um, are, what are some of the other areas that, uh, that will be providing services that are not placement services? Well, it really, uh, you know, a lot of the discussion had to do with children, and there's very few exemptions with children. Most of, the, most of the exemptions that people are talking about are really with adults. I mean, a lot of the discussion last night had to do with health exemptions, and, and, and frankly, the best interest of the child language supersedes everything. If there are services that are being recommended by the department for the child in, in the transition program, in uh, the, the placement program itself, services that need to be provided in the best interest of the child, and those services are something that the, uh, uh, the provider or the placement doesn't believe are services that they want to provide based on their sincerely held religious beliefs, how can we ensure that those services will be provided? Well, that, that, that would be uh, CPS's responsibility, and, and, and really they are, they are in the role of the parent. They are using the foster parent to, uh, uh, yeah, but, but that, 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 that assumes that, that the services would. are available somewhere. If the services are only available through providers who are uh, connected to some faith-based organization that uh, but, doesn't believe in that particular type of, of service. But you're talking about health, health provisions to the child. Let's say that, and, yes. And, and those, those, are provided, those are provided everywhere. I don't know where the health services wouldn't be available. If, it, if a child, though, uh, if the, pro, the, the plan, the service plan for the child required certain services that did not comport with the religious beliefs of the caretakers, and the provider in the area, how would we be assured that those children would receive the services then, that then, then are there required? Would be the, then there would be the same reasonable accommodations that we make any time a foster parent is having trouble meeting those needs. There is always a balance uh, with CPS to provide reasonable accommodations. We're just asking that these be included among those reasonable accommodations. But, but from so, all, the, all the work that you've been doing right now, would you say that most children are getting the services that are required? Um, yes, I believe, I believe so. And I, I think at the end of the day, when we have great foster homes, then kids get better care. When we have great CPS workers, kids get better care and we have better judges. And so I think the more we can do to bring better uh, and more uh, services at the table, it helps. So you had an amendment that was accepted, but what I want to ask you about is that um, it doesn't give CPS any authority if someone fails to provide an alternative. It says the agency shall provide a list of other providers or point folks to the DFPS website, but if they don't, the state has no recourse, do they? Yeah, and I actually, we also I also mentioned that we had three different referral. I'm sorry, I can't hear. We had three different referral amendments that we gave as options, and you know, asked for feedback for several days, and and that's the one we ended up with. So, 
There's no requirement that a child welfare provider or foster family refer a child to an alternative provider for services that they refuse. There's no, no requirement. Even if a teen who's been sexually assaulted wants emergency contraception, a foster family can say that goes against their religious beliefs and it's up to the sexually assaulted girl to notify DFPS that she's been refused this care? Again, if, if a child has been sexually assaulted, CPS is going to be on the scene. They're, they, it's not like that happens in a vacuum. I think, I think part of the issue here, though, is that there's, there don't seem to be requirements in here or reporting mechanisms for, to give assurances that these things are being uh, followed and that um, we're aware of, of when services are being denied, we're aware of when uh, there's a referral to an alternative provider and whether or yeah. not the needs are actually being met. With a lack of reporting, I don't know how we can determine the effectiveness yeah, and we, yeah, and we, and we had this discussion about the reporting, but we, ha we have a tremendous amount of reporting right now and we don't always know. Um, yeah. Well, you know, I, I guess <laughs> the way I'm looking at this now is that the, this bill violates my deeply held religious beliefs in the separation of church and state. Okay. And well, I, I don't know if, I, I know that you don't seem to agree with me on this, but HB 3859 appears to give permission to taxpayer funded faith based providers to determine who and what services are acceptable to them based on their deeply held religious beliefs and then to deny services accordingly. You well, are suggesting they can deny services. Well, well I, think what, I think what it does is it allows everyone, regardless of whether they agree with everything that you believe, to participate. It allows actually us to it live allows, in a, it allows, it doesn't, it, okay. may I finish? It allows us to live in a pluralistic society where not everybody believes the exact same thing and makes reasonable accommodations so that we don't have a group that is providing a lot of these services pushed out for things that have nothing to do with the best interest of the child. I think the big concern though really has to do with the fact that we're using taxpayer dollars to fund what can be construed as discriminatory practices. Well, I, I, it's, the faith-based communities are wonderful, as, provide valuable as, services, as and we want them to continue to do so. As long as they agree with exactly what you believe. There, there's no enforceable or reportable requirement, though, to ensure that foster parents or foster children are referred to another accommodating provider, and you're asking me to have faith that this is going to work. Well, I, and I, th I, I think I, we all need to continue to work on trying to improve the foster care system. And I think this is, this is just one small step. There's a number of things that obviously we, that we need to do. And I think we'll be in agreement with the vast majority of those. Well, I hope so. I mean, I, I, I am concerned about being asked to have faith that this is going to work out. I'm not sure I, that I, faith is the best way I, to have public I, I, policy. I understand. And I, and I do think from a, from a constitutionality, we do have a long history since the beginning of our time of making reasonable accommodations for religious beliefs and to allow them to participate, but it doesn't mean that we're, we're, we're not actually, we're not establishing a religion, we're not telling somebody what they have to believe, we're actually allowing people in this country to think differently than each other. That's important. We allow people to think differently than each other.